things to get on with. So good evening and welcome. Thank you everyone for joining us this evening for our Energy Efficiency Financing Solutions Workshop, uh, which we very hastily converted into a webinar, uh, given everything that's going on with the COVID-19 situation. So again, we're really appreciative of everyone taking the time to join us this evening. Um, so as I mentioned, this is a webinar that uh, we have created. Um, and this is the first time we've ever done anything like this. Um, so if anybody is having any technical issues um, or uh, has any questions and they can't get onto the chat box or the Q&A box to communicate with us, please feel free to send us an email at resource at biospheriinstitute.org or you can go onto our Facebook page and uh, message us directly through the Facebook platform uh, and we'll do our best to try and figure out any technical <laughs> issues that you might be experiencing um, this evening. And there we go. So uh, hopefully uh, in your welcome emails, uh, a lot of you have been really helpful and have taken part in our research uh, that we've been doing as part of this uh, energy efficiency education series. Um, uh, for those of you that don't know, we've been working with a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Alberta, Dr. Jill Budafield, and she has been helping us um, analyze the success of our workshops. So helping us understand um, how effective our educational tools have been. Um, so I would really just encourage anyone who hasn't yet participated in the survey uh, that is specific to this evening, uh, just to take a moment, take a hold of your phone, um, pull up the camera function and take a picture of the QR code, which is the big black and white square on the screen and just spend a few moments whilst I'm introducing uh, the rest of the webinar and take part in that survey. Um, it would really help us out and we'd really appreciate it if you could. Uh, the reason we wanna do this is because Finding funding for these kind of projects is really difficult. And by analyzing our success, uh, we can do a better job of telling our story to funders. Uh, and it also you know, allows us to continue doing this work into the future because we can see how valuable it has been to uh, our attendees as we go forward. Um, so again, if you just take a moment and take, do the survey, if you haven't already done it, we would appreciate that uh, wholeheartedly. Um, so for those of you that don't know, uh, we are the Biosphere Institute of the Bow Valley. Um, we are a local charity based here in Camor, and our goal is to encourage local residents and businesses to become active environmental stewards of our mountain environment. Um, we focus on what we believe are the two biggest challenges uh, threatening our valley today, one of which is human wildlife coexistence. So you've probably heard of our WildSmart programming. And the second is climate change. Um, our climate action programming is managed under the Bow Valley Shift program. Um, and we're using this program to try and shift people's attitudes uh, towards climate change and to help them reduce their water use, their energy use, uh, take more active transportation and reduce their use, uh, sorry, their waste. Uh, so, you know, shifting to a, a more sustainable future. So first of all, before we get going tonight, um, the Biosphere would really like to say a huge thank you to everyone who's helped us get to this point this evening. Um, so with funding from Energy Efficiency Alberta and the town of Camo, um, the Biosphere Institute spent six months in 2019 asking local businesses and residents what they wanted to learn about energy efficiency and how they best wanted to learn it. Um, we analyzed the feedback and with the help of local specialists, some of which you'll hear from this evening, um, we developed this workshop series um, to address the topics and formats that were most resonating with the community, i.e. they were most interesting and people were really um, hopefully engaged <laughs> in our workshop series as we go. So thank you to everyone who took part in that. Um, so tonight is the final one. Um, We've already done two workshops, one on uh, residential renewable energy solutions, uh, which is on February the 20th, and the second on efficient heating and cooling of your home, which is on March 5th. Um, and don't worry, if you missed any of those, you can catch up online on our YouTube channel. Um, and in the future, they will be also hosted on the Biosphere website, along with resources 
um, from each of those uh, presentations. Um, and we'll be hosting this one online as well. Um, so at any point you can go back and, and review the information. So you don't need to take notes. So on to tonight's agenda. Um, tonight you're going to hear presentations focused around the biggest question when it comes to energy efficiency. How much does it cost and how on earth am I going to pay for it? Um, this evening is designed to help you understand the energy auditing process, which as you'll very shortly find out is an incredibly important step when it comes to figuring out the energy efficiency of your home. And you're going to learn about current retrofit program financing options and um, get some information on the province's new clean energy improvement program. Um, unfortunately, this evening we have had a slight incident with one of our speakers who is not able to join us tonight, Marla Slatter from the Bow Valley Credit Union. Um, however, Nancy from Genworth has very kindly stepped in and said that she would go over her presentation very briefly to give you the highlights so that you don't miss out on anything. Um, and if you want any more information on any of that, I would advise you to go and talk to a financial advisor um, going forward. Um, if you have any questions this evening, please feel free to type them into the chat box or the question and answer box. Um, and we'll do our best to answer all the questions at the end. Um, and with that, I will pass you on to our first presentation of the evening. Uh, I'd like to welcome Stephen Downs uh, from Map Energy, who is going to talk to you about the process of energy auditing. Uh, over to you, Stephen. Thank you very much, Jody. Appreciate that. So let's see if we can uh, get this to work, shall we? Here we go. There we go. So can you see that okay? We can see you, Stephen. Thank you. So the question is being asked uh, through uh, through the association and uh, from Jody and and for those who are participating on this is that uh, what is an energy audit and basically what does it contain? And so just try to uh, address those different questions along the way for uh, maybe for the next 10 or 15 minutes. Just a quick background on myself. I'm, I'm a registered energy advisor through Natural Resources Canada. I not only look at existing homes, but also uh, new homes as well, uh, to standards such as uh, energy star for new homes, um, passive house, which we starting to be, uh, gain traction here in Alberta, and uh, Canada as a whole, and even uh, net zero or near zero homes. So we'll uh, talk about that very quickly as we move on here. So really, the, a lot of it, uh, as far as an order is concerned, is to do with the value of the inner guide rating. And the, so we'll talk about that as, uh, as we move forward. So basically, an energy audit is a, uh, is a comprehensive evaluation of the three core components of a building. And, and, and people don't necessarily understand or, or realize what um, the interaction of those three parts uh, play in making a house or a building uh, more energy efficient or more importantly, uh, comfortable as we move forward. So, and we'll try and address those different things as we go forward. So, so the three core components, uh, as you can see there pretty much, is, uh, is first of all the building envelope. So imagine your, your house or your building as a, as a cube, and so the building envelope is that barrier that's uh, keeping you warm inside and keeping that cold out, which is obviously very important, or in some climates it could be a reverse and trying to keep you cool in, in the peak of summer and, and keeping that heat out. The second is to do with the, the mechanical systems, what's operating. Really, there's three main parts that you really consider there. Uh, of course, the principal heating system, and then uh, hot water generation, and then also ventilation needs. And the last is to do with their leakage. So we wanna keep that, uh, that cold winds from blowing through our home, so we, we test the homes uh, for air leakage and, and testing as we go forward. So, Yes, you can see the, the line of the building there. I, I want everyone to sort of just uh, step back and think for a moment and, and just visualize where is not necessarily the building envelope, but more the, the thermal envelope for your home. So what I'm saying is where is the barrier that's, that you are wanting to keep warm, uh, or what's that barrier that you want to keep warm from inside and keeping that cold out. So whether it be the attic above 
for it could be the walls, including windows and doors, um, your basement walls, and of course even your basement or foundation floor. So and we have to realize that heat is lost in many different ways. So some people don't, some think that if we put more insulation in our attics, as an example, then we're gonna make our houses more comfortable. Not necessarily true. Uh, we all understand that hot air rises. Uh, if we imagine a, a hot air balloon, we've seen those. Um, that works on the principle of hot air rising uh, to give a, a lifting force to, uh, for the basket and the people to enjoy that, that, uh, that uh, benefit of a hot air balloon. But the thing is that heat is lost in all directions. So you are losing heat uh, through your foundation floor just as much you are through your basement walls, your main walls of the house, and uh, even through your attic spaces. So just to realize that as you're moving forward, you want to have a, a balanced um, a thermal envelope, building envelope moving forward. As I talked about with the mechanical systems, it's pretty obvious. The principal heating system, there are a number of different heating systems out there, which I do realize. Uh, principally here in Alberta, we, we're usually generally using uh, natural gas as a form of, uh, of fuel for principal heating. But how efficient is that system? So there are a number of things to look at as far as the efficiency of that. Um, hot water generation, again, is a natural gas or electricity, and even ventilation systems for the home. It is important. But going back to heating just for a moment, even for hot water, I just want people just to realize that when you are using a fuel source such as natural gas, uh, or could even be anything else for that matter, such as uh, water, oil, or something like that, uh, the, technically the maximum efficiency you can get out of that system is 100%. If you can capture 100% of the heat as you're burning something, that's the best you can ever achieve. And most furnaces nowadays, very good furnaces, are generally around about 96% in efficiency, which is pretty good. But if you think about uh, heat pump technology, then the efficiency could be uh, around about 200 to 300%. So that's a significant improvement. And we're not going to get into those details today, but the fact of the matter is that there are technologies out there to that can vastly improve the efficiency of your heating and even hot water generation. Air leakage testing, um, as you can see by the little image there, the, the blower door, uh, the red door that's pretty, uh, uh, pretty common with programs that's taken place in the past. Air leakage testing is, uh, is very, very important in making for a comfortable and an enjoyable home or building. Uh, nowadays, the understanding and the technology that goes into uh, testing homes is, is quite advanced and, uh, and really it comes down to the fact that the tighter the, the, the environment uh, that you're trying to achieve within your home, the better off you are. But it all comes down to control. Uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, as you're making your house or building tighter, then you are able to control and regulate that environment that you're looking to achieve within your home. Um, better than that environment outside trying to control you. And I haven't really found too many people yet that can stop the wind and anything else along the way. So if you can, please let me know. But uh, really it comes down to the fact of making the houses and doing the testing to find out how they're leaky and what uh, strategies that we can come up with to make it a lot better moving forward. So once we've gathered all that information, we talked to you, and once we get that information, we have a software program that's developed by Natural Resources Canada. Um, and it's a very comprehensive program. It's called the Interguide Rating System. So the Interguide Rating System basically is a, as it says, is a rating system or a score that you can achieve uh, for your home that measures the energy that you use and consume within your house. And it works on a decreasing scale. And basically, it just shows you what it is that, that uh, based on the size of your home, the number of occupants within the home, uh, and sort of the, your lifestyle that you may live. Some people are home 24 hours a day, or some people are on, on a regular schedule. Uh, so we are able to work out, based on the construction of your home, based on the systems that you're running within your home, and come up with this uh, inner guide rating moving forward. And it's measured in gigajoules. And I realize that's a technical term. And for most people, 
you know, what does it really mean? It's, you know, it's, it's a number. But the fact of the matter is that as you gain more knowledge moving forward, you can see how good or bad that number is in comparison to the industry average moving forward. So it is a relationship. And what we're trying to do is uh, move towards a goal or um, uh, achieve a goal of what is best for you and, uh, and also what you're looking to ultimately achieve as far as comfort for you in your home. So it is based on the energy that you consume versus the energy that you produce in the way of renewable technologies, such as solar as an example. So uh, it is a, a very, it's a nice number to, to look at as you move forward because the very fact that as you work on, first of all, what you consume, then you can start to focus on later on once you've lowered down that number as far as you can go, then you can look at the renewable piece moving forward. So how does the score work? So as I got there, how low can you go? Well, really you can go down to zero, but ultimately, first of all, you want to be working on your building first to reduce your energy consumption as much as you can uh, in improving the building envelope, uh, upgrading your mechanical systems, making the building as airtight as physically possible. And by doing that, just working on the consumption piece, you can only get down to around about 25 to 30 gigajoules uh, if you're building a very, very advanced or up, updating a very advanced, you're, sorry, updating your current building to a very advanced standard. Because you still got, at the end of the day, you still have to run your appliances, you have to have your refrigerator on, you're gonna be having a shower, you're gonna be turning the lights on, you're gonna be having the TV and the computers on. So you're still gonna have a base load of, of energy consumption no matter what you do. So on the consumption side of things, there's only a limit to what you can achieve. But once you've got that down as far as you can go, then you can start to consider and looking into putting in uh, renewable technologies such as solar and such like. So that scale there gives you a bit of an idea of sort of where um, construction is. Uh, it is does start at about 200 gigajoules. It could even be higher for a, a very old and very inefficient building. But generally most buildings uh, based on building code is around about 120 gigajoules. And then it, as you start to put in more uh, advanced construction processes, such as achieving goal like Energy Star, then you can be around 60 and then as you start to consider even more advanced construction, such as what we're hearing now, like Passive House, and then you can really get down to very, very low scores. So that gives you a bit of an idea of, of what you can achieve moving forward. But what is really the real value of the, of the rating? And so the score rating is nice, but really ultimately it's a measure of comfort and efficiency. So energy efficiency doesn't necessarily give you comfort, but comfort can give you efficiency moving forward. And that's what people are looking for. Really, what people are desiring is making their houses uh, a lot more enticing to be able to live in and be comfortable from a thermal perspective. So we talk to you about what your goals and objectives are, and we help you move towards that goal. Energy efficiency itself really is not, is really a byproduct of actually comfort. Really what you're looking to achieve is making your home thermally, thermally comfortable so that you uh, can enjoy your home and not be cold in the winter time or not be overly hot in the summertime moving forward. So that's what it comes down to. So the value of comfort. And so really the, the idea is to, do you, the question is to be asked, do you have the type of environment that you feel is warm and comfortable and healthy? And so by our focus being doing the energy audit is focusing on those aspects, then energy efficiency in a lot of respects uh, falls into place behind that. And there is a, a, an ideal as far as temperature is concerned and humidity is concerned. And so we try to highlight to, to homeowners and, and, and occupants what it is that we need to be able to achieve to maintain that comfort that you're looking to enjoy. And here's some numbers just to go by. 
Um, this is not necessarily a fixed rule, but generally the measures for thermal comfort is if it's within a range. Everyone is different. Uh, we've heard things like uh, thermostat wars and such like, but as you make your buildings a lot more efficient and a lot more comfortable, really the thermostat really is not a, a big issue. But there's a whole the host of psychological and physiological reasons why some people feel cold and some people uh, can feel warm even in the same space um, and based on gender or age and, and a whole host of different factors moving forward. But there are some ideals. And so these are some ideal numbers for the temperature. We also understand, particularly under this uh, current uh, virus uh, environment that we're dealing with right now, uh, it has now been proven that if we can maintain the humidity within our buildings and homes between 40 and 60 percent, then our chances of being a little bit healthier are increased. And so that's what we want. We also want to maintain that we need some airflow within our homes, but it needs to be controlled and there is a measure for that. And even for things like carbon dioxide, global warming is a big thing. Jody brought that out about climate change. And so we also want to try to maintain a level of carbon dioxide within our buildings within an acceptable range as well. So there's some numbers to go with that. So really when it comes down to, you really want to try to build, we want, we want to be making our homes and buildings a healthy and enticing productive environment or enclosure, enclave. Something that you feel comfortable when and is able, and you would know that there's a, there's a sense of well-being within those places. And by achieving that first, then of course, by so, a lot of respects, by default, then it also happens to be energy efficient as you go forward. So if you are concerned about the house and, and thermal comfort in your home, so what sort of things can you do without having to necessarily spend the cost of, of going out and getting an energy order done straight away? Not that I'm trying to discourage you from doing that, you should. But there's a few things that you can do yourself initially to start off with. And so first I suggest that maybe sit down with a piece of paper and a pen and, or pencil and just define what is your thermal envelope. What is, where's that barrier that's keeping you warm inside and keeping that cold out? And once you've established that, then you can work on a bit of an action plan as you move forward. The second thing that you can do is seal up your home. You'd be surprised how many small holes and leaks and, and gaps and such like that, uh, which by themselves are very small and maybe inconsequential, but really when it comes down to it, when you start to add them up, it can be quite large and significant. Another way when we do the blow it all test as an example, we talk about um, as a measure, we say, what's the equivalent leakage area for the home based on the, on the surface area? So, so we just use some analogy. Sometimes, uh, sometimes when we do this test. We talk about is the is the equivalent size of the holes in the building envelope the size of a, say a baseball, or is it the size of a soccer ball, or is it the size of a beach ball? And that's and that's what the, that image. If you get that in your mind, if you have that equivalent size hole within your walls of your homes, then how comfortable would you be? And, but the thing about it is it, it's, it's the accumulation of all those different small holes and leaks and cracks. So that doesn't cost money. It doesn't cost money to seal up a home. It's very easy to do, very easy to achieve, and you'll be surprised what sort of results you can achieve. Then of course, get an audit done as well, and we'll help you identify some different concerns and help you go through the process of, of making your home a lot more comfortable and give you a comprehensive report or a, or a game plan that you can work towards as you go along. And that's really about it for me. So if anyone has any questions at the end, please feel free to, to uh, ask away and I'll be hanging on to this, uh, this call. And I thank you for the opportunity to be able to, uh, uh, to do this little presentation for you, Jody, and for, for the citizens and residents of Canmore. You're welcome, Stephen, thank you very much. Um, so, as Stephen mentioned, if anyone has any questions, please just pop them in the chat box or the Q&A. Um, and we're just going to hand over to Valerie Atkinson from KCP Energy, who's going to talk to you about a solar financing opportunity.
Thanks, Jody. You guys can hear me, I'm assuming. Everybody's good? Yes, we're all good. Awesome. Okay, give me one second here. Okay, um, thanks for having us again, Jody. We've done a few of these now, um, and we're always excited to work with you guys and to share all of this information. No, oh, there we go. So in case we have some new participants um, and you guys aren't sure who we are, KCP Energy was established in 2007 in Canmore. Um, a couple of years ago, we did move our location to Calgary just because we grew in size and, and Jeff and I could no longer work out of his basement. Um, today we do work all over Western Canada and we provide solar solutions to commercial, residential, agricultural and government bodies. So in 2018, KCP Energy began working with ATB to develop the solar financing program. Um, it was really born out of a need where um, KCP saw that our customers didn't have a financing option. Um, some of you who maybe have gone down the solar path have spoken with NMAX, for example, and and Max is an establishment that is large enough to be able to offer financing. But as an installer, that's not something that we and a lot of our counterparts can offer. So since we saw this need and wanted to make solar um, available for as many people as possible, we went to ATB to develop this program. Um, and we were really excited. It was, I think we were the very first installer to actually be able to offer it for a little while there. And then ATB opened it up to everybody in Alberta. The program is open to residential, commercial, agricultural, and nonprofit customers. And the really cool thing um, about the program is that it isn't just solar PV related. So a lot of people, um, when they do solar are also considering other options when it comes to um, either a new build or retrofitting their home. For example, a Tesla power wall. So they're looking at battery backup solutions or they're also thinking about doing an electric vehicle and so they need a charging station, for example. And so if you're doing solar and you are also looking to include those items, they can be included in the loan application as well as part of the entire project. So for residential financing, you have two options. You can do an unsecured linked line of credit as low as prime plus 2%, or you can do unsecured variable rate time plan personal loan with amortizations of five, 10, or 15 years as low as prime plus 2%. And we have five year variable rate terms only is what they offer. And the nice thing about this loan is that the loan can be paid off at any time without penalty. Agricultural financing, so if you um, have a farm, ATB can work with you to customize financing that will suit your needs. So they have loans up to $100,000, amortization periods up to 15 years, loan value up to 80%. And if your solar installation is greater than 25,000, they can do um, the rate of prime plus 1%. And if it's less than 25, then you're looking at prime plus 2%. And then they also have fixed rates available. And for business and commercial financing, and this is where the nonprofits uh, sector would fall into this, um, ATB is able to customize financing to meet your needs. Um, so every business is different, and depending on the size of the system and what the meet, what the needs are, um, then what we do is we sit down and we facilitate meetings with the business and ATB Financial. And so how do you apply? Um, so KCP Energy is here to help you. So first things first, you get a solar PV quote and you're signing a contract with us to determine how big the system is and what the costs are that are involved. You can finance the entire amount or you can put down a down payment, for example, and finance a portion of the system cost. KCP Energy will assist you with your application. 
So we will come, for example, when I'm doing a residential sale, I will come and sit down with you as the homeowner and we will go through the loan application together and I will help you fill out that application. And then what I will do is I will take that paperwork and I will submit that application on your behalf and work with ATB Financial. Um, during that process, you're going to need to provide us with two pieces of identification, one photo ID and uh, your most recent T4 or T1 if you're self-employed. And upon pre-approval, ATB Financial will determine the closest branch for you to sign your paperwork. So luckily in Canmore, you can go to the branch here, or if you're in BAMP, for example, you can go to the branch there. And then once the funds have been approved and the paperwork's been signed, then it can be sent directly to us and then we can start your project. And that's it. Short and sweet for me, Jody. <laughs> and if you guys have questions, uh, yeah, you can hold them till the end and I'll be more than happy to uh, answer those for you. Great, thank you, Valerie. Um, a really awesome program there organized by KCP and ATB. Um, really worth thinking about if you're looking at uh, solar and you're not sure necessarily the best way to finance it. Um, so it's really great to hear about these awesome initiatives going forward. Um, so next up, we have Nancy Kamineski uh, from Genworth, who is also going to very kindly uh, give Marla Schlatter's presentation from uh, the Bow Valley Credit Union. Uh, over to you, Marla. Oh, sorry, Nancy. <laughs> <laughs> That's no problem at all. Sure, I'll just get my screen ready here. Get it into presentation mode. Can everyone hear me okay? Uh, yes, we can hear you. Perfect. Well, um, I will try to do my best in regards to Marla's presentation. Um, Marla is uh, a uh, manager at the Bow Valley Credit Union here in Canmore. And I, from Genworth, Canada, have worked with her for uh, the last 14 and a half years in various roles and Genworth Canada does uh, a lot of work with uh, all of the uh, lenders, brokers, builders and insurers within the Canadian market space. Um, just a little bit about myself and, and why I am going to be talking about Marla's presentation is uh, I do come from a financial services background. I've, uh, I've been in the industry for 28 and a half years, 14 and a half years with Genworth Canada and I am pleased to be able to um, marry this information uh, together tonight with my energy efficiency housing program presentation that will follow suit from what Genworth has to offer. Uh, to start out with uh, Marla's presentation, what she really wanted to focus on was taking a look at the uh, financial planning, the home buying process, uh, ensuring that uh, individuals are planning for home upgrades. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about using a budget for planning, working through financial goals, uh, the importance of bringing in partners and resources such as Valerie and Stephen that we, that we heard from today as well, um, working through savings options, financing options, and then ultimately what that mortgage transaction looks like. Uh, so when we go through it and we take a look at planning for your home upgrade, you wanna make sure you really do your research. Don't just um, get driven into that, hey, you know what, that one has all of the bells and whistles, it's exactly what I want. Do your research, understand what is important to you, the type of upgrade that you want to pursue, and then finally, how you can afford that and how you are going to be able to pay for that. We want to encourage home ownership, but we definitely want it to be affordable so you can actually enjoy that sense of community that you're a part of. And that just leads into financial goals, taking a look at understanding what your short, medium and long-term goals are. Uh, and when we talk about short-term goals, usually that's anything less than a year. Uh, when you're looking at medium term, uh, that can be one to three years or one to four or five years. And then long-term, of course, uh, down the horizon. 
some of the things to consider when you are looking at financial goals, planning out a life cycle, finding out what type of home is suitable for you. Um, do you have student concerns? Um, or are you a first time home buyer looking to buy your first home? You may also have a whole lot of other expenditures such as your first car. Uh, lots of things to again consider that typically are unplanned for when you actually start getting into your home purchase. So the importance of thinking of all of these financial goals with relation to your life cycle is of the utmost importance. And also take a look at debt reduction. So will you actually have additional costs because of, because of uh, children and their schooling activities? Or perhaps you have older children that will be moving on to post-secondary educations. And then retirement. You want to save enough for your retirement to make the transactions make sense. Some other things with life cycles, um, triggers and reminders. Um, give yourself the opportunity to review and rebalance those plans. It's really important to not only make a plan, but also follow up with that plan. And consider other personal and family goals that could play into it that will impact what you maybe want to do with your additional cash flow and savings that you have. And then as well, considering for estate and the next generation goals, if you're looking at wanting to leave anything behind or take a look at uh, giving those types of generation uh, goals to trusts, for an example. Uh, make sure they're measurable, specific, and trackable. So when you do make a plan, follow up with it, whether that be every six months, uh, heading into a year. It's something you definitely do want to revisit. And things to consider for when you are preparing or updating your household budgets, that's the whole purpose of a budget, to make sure that you can stay balanced and comfortable by satisfying all of the needs that you actually have. So utilizing the budget in the financial planning is key. Really get started, decide on your goals, what you want, and then design your budget accordingly. Prioritize things, make entries, and then of course, confirm, address, and continue to check that. When we take a look at um, uh, who and how you can make those plans, you want to include any professional partners into that conversation that can really guide you throughout that process and just give you that validation factor of, does this make sense? Is this going to meet my short, medium, and long-term goals? And that could be, uh, in addition, considering other savings or financing strategies, uh, as well as getting into tax planning and consulting legal partners within the industry as well. And then finally, insurance professionals. So have your home insurance reviews updated, have adequate coverage to really give you that peace of mind. When you are working through uh, savings goals, uh, again, check that timeline. Ensure that your savings vehicles are going to be there to assist you with your savings goals so that you can draw from them when it's needed. And then there are a wide variety of tax implications as well to consider. Um, so definitely some products may be better suited depending on what your overall strategy is. Some of those for an idea, an example, are tax-free savings accounts, registered retirement savings plans, or maybe it's just something like a GIC. Depending on what your risk tolerances and advertisements can all drive the decisioning factor behind this. So get in front of a financial planner to really help you with that process. And consider how you can potentially grow that plan quicker, more affordably. Maybe it's a matter of considering other consumer or personal loans or having the flexibility of utilizing a home equity line of credit. And I'll talk about some improvements towards a home that can be done. Or it's a mortgage or other considerations. Maybe it's investment properties that you wanna get into as well. 
or you want to buy additional properties for uh, a family member or an elderly parent. And that leads us into the mortgage process. So we want to make sure that we're considering um, not only new but existing homeowners as well. So does that home that you're in actually right now meet your needs and again your long term needs. It's not a matter of upsizing or downsizing. It's a matter of right sizing. Although things to consider uh, various first time home buyer incentive programs out there down payment sources uh, of numerous time kinds can be utilized. Uh, as well as insured versus conventional mortgages. And there's pros and cons to both of those. And then as well, considering all costs, such as the principal and interest of the mortgage, the insurance, the taxes. And then finally, uh, moving into and considering most importantly, in this economic environment of ours, the energy efficiency housing programs. And I know we are going to defer questions until the end. So with that note, I will just get right into my portion of the energy efficiency housing presentation. And things that I would actually like to talk through today are ultimately uh, the program guidelines. The program that I am going to speak to this evening is over and above the government funded programs that Genworth Canada as one of the three uh, mortgage insurers, and we are the largest private mortgage insurer within the Canadian space, uh, does offer and extend out to our clients. It's extremely underutilized, so I really do appreciate the time uh, to speak to this program tonight. I'll talk through some of the en energy efficiency requirements, as well as some of the documentation and program eligibility as well. So just starting out with a stat, uh, today's consumers are increasingly uh, considering the energy efficiency of their home in their buying decisions. In fact, in a recent survey that Genworth actually just did, 72% of the participants deemed that energy efficiency was very important at 29% of that 72%, or 44% qu uh, indicated it was somewhat important. And those were factors when they were choosing their current home. And as you can see, the chart it definitely ranked alongside other importances, such as proximity to work, the type of neighborhood and community they really wanted to be a part of, and how they can raise their children, and what kind of features and upgrades will allow that flexibility. So getting into the energy efficiency housing program. At Genworth, we really want to help protect the environment and support consumers when they are looking at making environmentally friendly choices. And that's something that's really important because when home buyers are purchasing an energy efficiency home, as long as Genworth insurance is obtained on that, so whether it be a high ratio or a low ratio mortgage, depending on how much they have to put down, if insurance is required on that, and it's through Genworth, they are eligible potentially to, to receive up to 25% of the premium that they're paying to the insurer for that coverage. So what's in it for the homeowner? Um, some key factors here that I really wanted to pay attention to was again, it's up to 25% of the mortgage insurance premium that they had paid. The savings is by way of a premium rebate. So I'll walk through the process and when that is confirmed that it is energy efficiency suited, uh, that is a payment that is actually made towards the consumer in form of a check back to them for cash. So simply by choosing a purchase uh, of an energy efficiency home, or if they're making improvements to an existing home that maybe they've just moved into, they can qualify for the refund of up to 25%. Some of the things that I actually um, recommend my clients when I'm talking through the process is get them thinking about what does that home buying process look like for you? What does that home include? Are they planning on making their home energy efficient? 
and what does that dream home really look like in their eyes. And this can help identify if the energy efficiency rebate program is suitable. When we take a look at how you qualify, you can qualify one of two ways. One, we do take a look at homes built through GenWorks Canada's qualifying energy efficiency building programs. And two of the national building programs, as an example, are the LEED and Energy Star ratings. Um, or as uh, we've already heard about, uh, the NR Canada uh, energy, EnerGuide requirements. So what is this rating? Simply, uh, as Stephen had indicated in his presentation, it's the amount of energy that you're actually, uh, that your home is physically producing uh, based on its consumption. There's two typical scales that are utilized, uh, a zero to 100 point scale um, or the gigajoule scale. When we understand the energy rating guides, um, obviously uh, at present, most provinces are using the zero to 100 point scale. However, uh, your province, depending on where the real estate is, may actually vary. So I would refer you to the website uh, for your province link, or you can refer to the Genworth, where inside our energy efficiency program, we do have the link that will take you right to those uh, government pages as well. So what does the refund eligibility look like? And this just gives you an information. I won't go through it in detail, um, just purely because of time. I do wanna save some time for the other presenter and questions. Uh, all of the information is on our website under genworth.ca, under the home buyer tab, products, and energy efficiency requirements. And then depending on, again, um, the program that they are utilizing with a 15% or 25% refund is really driven by how energy efficient their home is. And again, by that giga scale, the lower the number, the better performance. Purchasing a home um, is definitely wise to make it more energy efficient. Um, with that, should have you just purchased a home and maybe you've only been in it for six months and you're identifying leaks and saying, hey, you know what, our bills are really high. How can I get this down? I want to be more conscious uh, in regards to my water utilization, how much heat I'm losing through my windows. Um, we spoke about furnace temperatures and whatnot. Making changes to your home can be done after possession up to a period of two years through our Purchase Plus Improvements Program as well. So depending on how many points you're actually increasing that energy efficiency will again determine how much of a rebate you will get back. And when we are dealing with high rise condominiums, uh, they do have to be uh, uh, qualified under LEED certification. For documentation requirements, um, program eligibility, uh, really straightforward. Uh, it's just a copy of the energy efficiency building program or the first page and of each the pre and post inspections that can be done. Um, although those are consumer paid for, uh, it definitely still does make your rebate very attractive when you are looking at getting 15 to 25% of your premium back in form of a check. And then when we take a look at program eligibility requirements, again, it's 24 months from date of closing. If in fact you're looking at um, making application for a refund, and any of the energy efficiency work that maybe has been completed on the property, um, or if it was a new property that you've purchased and that energy efficiency documentation exists, cannot be greater than five years old. The refunds are issued after we have received the mortgage insurance premium from the lender. And again, that check, uh, there is a one-page document that the client uh, fills out 
they we send it in to us. We have a third party provider uh, review the documentation. And then often within seven to 10 business days, the consumer has that check back in their hands uh, for that 15 or 25% refund. Uh, here is a link just in regards to how to contact an energy advisor, as I have indicated. And again, it's the link to the NR Canada site on our genworth.ca website, should you find that a little easier to remember. And then when we are going through the, the premium rebate, uh, I've indicated where those forms are found. Again, very quick, very efficient. We don't delay that process. We want to get that money back to the consumer so you can put it to work uh, in a better way other than having to pay the full premiums. And on that note, uh, that does conclude my presentation and maybe I'll hand it back over. Thank you, Nancy, much appreciated. Um, lots of useful information there, which I wish I had known a couple of years ago when I bought my house. <laughs> Um, okay, so uh, last but certainly not least, uh, we're going to hand over to Carly Beaver from Energy Efficiency Alberta, who is going to talk to you about the province's Clean Energy Improvement Program. Thank you. Um, I'll just get my screen up to share. Okay, so um, yeah, I'm Carly from Energy Efficiency Alberta, and I'll be talking about the Clean Energy Improvement Program, um, which is Alberta's approach, approach to property assessed clean energy, or PACE as it's sometimes known. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about PACE, talk a little bit about um, the legislation um, here in Alberta that enables PACE, and then talk a little bit about our program details. Um, so a little bit about Energy Efficiency Alberta. Um, so we were established in 2017 and in the past you may have heard of or participated in some of our incentive programs for both uh, homes and businesses. Um, we're really moving towards working to mobilize private capital for energy efficiency and renewable energy projects as well as really raising awareness and building capacity in the energy efficiency industry as we move forward. So what is PACE? Um, so PACE is Property Assessed Clean Energy. Um, so this is a financing program that's really innovative that um, leverages the municipal property tax system to support a property owner's repayment for clean energy investments. So it really works with municipalities to get um, individuals in their communities um, putting in energy efficiency projects and retrofits and um, really building up the building stock in their communities. It's a really popular program um, in the States. Um, it's where we see a lot of the uptake, um, but it's starting to come into Canada as well. So some of the, some of the benefits of the PACE program, um, it's low cost upfront financing for the full project cost. Um, it has long repayment terms, so, and they're quite flexible. So it does depend on um, the lifetime of the product that you're putting in. So we really want to match the savings that you're going to be seeing with the payments that you're going to be making on those products. Um, it helps increase job creation and economic activity, as well as reducing greenhouse gas emissions and increasing property values. Uh, it is 100% voluntary for both the municipality and the participants. Um, so a municipality really has to opt into the program and pass a bylaw for it to uh, come into effect in their community. So there's been a lot of success in other jurisdictions. Um, it's been around for a while in the States, as I said. Um, so the residential side of PACE has seen really big uptake. So almost $5 billion in financing um, has been done, um, mostly energy efficiency, but that renewable energy has been increasing. Commercial PACE has been a little bit slower to get moving. Um, but these are really, really big projects. So almost a billion dollars have been financed um, in about 2000 projects. So they're really big, really interesting projects um, that are being done through that commercial side. 
And uh, Pace is pop getting more popular in the Canadian market as well. So both um, Nova Scotia and Ontario have had um, enabling legislation around 2010. Um, they've started mostly with pilot programs, but uh, they've been quite popular and they're still around today. So um, Nova Scotia has Halifax's Solar City, um, which is one of the most popular programs there. Um, and it's obviously just solar, but Toronto's HELP program um, is also moving along and they do both um, renewable energy and energy efficiency retrofits. So Alberta's approach to PACE is the Clean Energy Improvement Program. So it provides homeowners with access to financing for energy efficiency and renewable energy projects. Um, and as I said before, the repayment goes through their existing property tax. So it's a similar process to a local improvement charge if there was an improvement on your sidewalk or something outside your house. So similar process in that way. It is 100% voluntary. Um, and it is enabled through provincial legislation. So a tiny bit into the legislation. So it was passed in 2018 um, and that just enables municipalities to pass bylaws to be able to levy those clean energy improvement taxes um, through their property tax system. Um, it also allows them to borrow the financing to be able to lend that money to people. And the Clean Energy Improvement Regulation um, comes with that bill and it really defines some of the program details and program design requirements, as well as outlines some eligibility criteria and maximum financing amounts there. So the next step for a municipality to uh, come into the PACE program, into the SEAT program, um, is to pass a bylaw. So once the bylaw is passed, then you can really get that program launched into their municipality. Um, so since the legislation has passed, um, we have been working with uh, municipalities and Albertans across all of Alberta to get this program, get everyone understanding what this program is and getting it ready to go. Um, so we've launched a municipal advisory council and we have um, a bunch of different municipalities across Alberta really helping us develop this program and making it great for all municipalities. We've launched some engagement sessions um, and we've supported bylaw adoption in a couple of municipalities now. And we're really getting into the details of that detailed program design. Um, Energy Efficiency Alberta is the program administrator province-wide. So we're really looking to develop a program that works all across Alberta and has kind of a standardized program design for all those that may be looking into the program and working through the program. Um, so I'll get a bit into eligibility. Um, so for a participant to be eligible, um, you have to be the legal owner of the property. You have to be current on your property tax payments and then current on mortgage payments if that is applicable to your property. Um, there's a variety of properties that are eligible. So we do work with um, residential properties. So single family homes, um, row houses, um, Multifamily buildings are also eligible, as well as commercial buildings, so office buildings, retail, businesses, warehouses, um, etc. Um, the one ineligible properties are government-owned properties and designated industrial properties are not eligible through this program. Um, for a project, so the project really has to um, increase the use of renewable energy or increase the energy efficiency of the property. All measures must be permanently fixed to the property and they must be completed by um, an EPRO network member that is trained for the SEAT program. So I'll go into a little bit more about EPROs later in the presentation. Um, and some of those examples of eligible upgrades are heating, so upgrading your furnace, um, some indoor and outdoor lighting, water heating, so if you want to install a tankless hot water heater, um, insulation, windows, looking at that building envelope that Stephen talked about before. Um, for commercial properties, there's also kitchen and refrigeration, and then um, our renewable energy, so solar PV um, and combined heat and power. Um, so the financing is available for the cost directly associated with the upgrade. So both the equipment and the installation costs. And there also is a 
15% buffer within there that can be used for incidental costs. So for example, if you're wanting to install a rooftop solar unit, um, you can use a little bit of that money that would be going towards the project to um, do any roofing repairs required to support that installation. Or um, if there's any mold remediation or something that needs to be done during um, an installation upgrade. So there are um, financing maximums that are outlined by the legislation. So for a residential project, the maximum is 50,000. For non-residential, it's a million. And for farmland, it's 300,000. The term of the loan is dependent on the lifetime of the improvement. So how long that improvement is gonna last, um, we wanna match that savings and those payments with that. Um, and the other, Restriction also defined by the legislation is that um, the annual tax payment paid by the property owner cannot double their current property tax payment. So an example is if Jane pays $2,000 in property tax for this year, then her seat um, tax cannot exceed $2,000. So that's just um, a restriction made to make sure that the upgrades and the payments are not too much for people to handle when they are doing those upgrades. And um, rebates and incentives that are um, through other programs, whether it's federal or municipal, can be stacked on this financing, which would then lower that total project cost and really make it an even better um, idea for people to go through. So a quick overview of how the program process works. So a property owner will pre-qualify for the program. So that's just to ensure that their property is in a participating municipality that has passed a bylaw and has a program that is active, that they're um, current on all their property tax payments and their mortgage payments. So once they're pre-qualified for the program, um, they can find a contractor for their project to get a quote if they know what they're gonna do. Um, they could potentially get a home energy evaluation if they don't quite know what the best um, upgrade is for them. Um, and similarly, a commercial co uh, program participant could go and get an energy audit for their building. So after finding a contractor and determining the upgrades they want to complete and getting a quote, the property owner will submit a project application to EEA to review. And then Upon approval of that project application, they will complete the project with their contractor. Once all program forms have been submitted and approved, uh, we will directly pay the contractor for the work completed and the municipality will put the clean energy improvement tax on their tax bill for the next tax year. Um, for participants, we really want to make sure that the program works for them and um, we have a variety of tools and resources to make sure that people are making smart, informed, and responsible choices about their clean energy improvement upgrades. Um, so we will have a variety of resources on our website. Um, we also have established um, our network of qualified contractors. So I talked about that before, our EPRO network. Um, and they'll be trained on the program and as well agree to a code of conduct and program policies. And um, we do reserve the right to remove contractors from the network. So we do have a bit of due diligence there around um, our contractors in the program. So a little bit more about that EPRO network. So if there are um, contractors or energy professionals that are interested in the program, we um, do have a sign up available right now for the network. Um, so you can go to efficiencyalberta.ca slash epro and sign up on there. Um, there's a variety of benefits for participating both in the epro network and in SEEP. So it helps get accessible financing for your clients um, with competitive financing rates. And um, you can help to turn proposals into funded projects as well as we have a variety of resources for all of our EPRO network members, um, tools, marketing materials to really help be successful in the program. Um, and then that's it for me, but if anyone has any 
questions or wants to chat further, um, feel free to email me at finance at efficiencyalberta.ca um, and we can chat further about the program. Okay, that's great. Thank you, Carly. Um, and just before we get into the question and answer uh, portion of the evening, um, I have a little question for our participants. Um, so um, now that you know uh, a little bit more about um, the Clean Energy Improvement Program, I was curious if anybody would be interested uh, in participating in the Clean Energy Improvement Program, if there was a program available uh, in Canmore or, or indeed the Bow Valley. So on your screen, you should see a little box that just popped up, um, it's interactive. So if you wanna um, put your answer uh, in there, uh, I'll give maybe another 30 seconds for anybody else who wants to join in. Um, and we'll take that information uh, back to the municipality to help them make the decisions on um, what it is that they want to take forward uh, as far as the Clean Energy Improvement Program. Um, so you got another 15 seconds if you want to have your say. Just putting pressure on it so that people vote really quick. Uh, five seconds left. Anybody else wants to? Poll and I'm going to close it. Oh, it looks pretty positive. Um, so we actually have a little bit of a tie. Um, it seems that people are really interested in the program, uh, but I think a few people might want a little bit more information. Um, so in which case, uh, feel free to ask some questions from Carly. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up um, the questions and we're going to see if anybody has put some questions in. So we have a question for Stephen. Um, what is the typical cost of an energy audit and what would the homeowner need to provide to facilitate one? So the typical cost is uh, usually around about uh, $450 or thereabouts. Um, I know that sounds a little bit uh, uh, wishy-washy, but it's a lot of us to do with the size of the home. If the home is of a, of a uh, overly significant size, it may be a little bit more of a, a, a custom approach to require. Uh, what does the homeowner need to provide? Uh, generally, um, a tax roll or some form of municipal uh, tax documentation, so we can just record not only the homeowner's uh, name and address information but also just some form of a, a municipal roll number or municipal um, designation number we can put in the file and that's about it really um, everything else um, we just uh, talk about at the time when we do the audit and uh, and we go through the process which does take about on average about uh, uh, two hours uh, uh, on site to uh, complete the audit and then uh, you get a report afterwards Okay, so we now have a couple of questions for Carly. Um, is an energy audit a requirement for any project approved to proceed under the Clean Energy Improvement Program? Yeah, so currently um, it's not required for all projects. However, some municipalities have decided to make that a requirement um, under their program. So we can work with municipalities to customize the program for um, what they want to um, get out of the program. So a lot of um, municipalities want people to make the most informed decision, which the best way to do that is to get an energy audit. So there will be some programs that do require an energy audit. And we definitely um, encourage people to get energy audits just to make that best decision for their, uh, for their upgrade in their home. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, another question for Carly. Uh, is the Clean Energy Improvement Program available in all municipalities in Alberta? So the legislation allows for any municipality in Alberta to um, pass a bylaw, but the bylaw has to be passed prior to the program launching in the municipality. 
Um, so it's really up to the municipality to work with EEA to develop that program and get that launched in their community. Okay, so each program is specific to each municipality and you would work with the municipality to create the program that's uh, applicable to them, is that correct? Yeah, exactly, yeah. So we have kind of our province-wide program design to make it as standardized as possible across all municipalities, especially for contractors that may be working in multiple areas. Um, but municipalities definitely have um, the ability to customize different aspects, such as the energy audit requirement within their program. Okay, great. And another question for Carly. Um, do you need a, to provide a year's worth of electricity and gas bills? Uh, not for our program as it is now. Um, potentially a municipality could ask for that kind of information, um, but we do not require that at this moment for the program. Oh, apologies. That question was meant for Stephen. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, so Stephen, uh, do you need to provide a year's worth of electricity and gas bills before you have an energy audit? Uh, no, it's not necessarily required, but it is uh, helpful so we can get a bit of an idea of, of where the concerns are, but it's not a requirement for the audit. Okay, perfect. And uh, I'm sorry, this question definitely is for Carly. <laughs> uh, which municipalities have the Clean Energy Improvement Program so far? Uh, so Rocky Mountain House and the Town of Devon have passed their enabling bylaws. Um, so we're currently working with them to nail down that final program design and we'll be working to launch um, in those two communities. Um, we're also working with a variety of different communities through our Municipal Advisory Council. So, and they're all um, at some stage of learning about the program um, and looking at packing bylaws as well. But at this point, Devon and Rocky Mountain House are kind of the leaders we're looking at so far by packing bylaws. Perfect, thank you. Uh, and I'd like to add on that point that for our participants here, Canmore is considering the Clean Energy Improvement Program. Um, so perhaps if you're interested, it might be worth reaching out to them and uh, letting them know uh, that this is something that you'd be interested in participating in. Because uh, obviously the more uh, interest people show, the more likely it is that we can get these awesome initiatives uh, into our community. Um, so I think that was all the questions that were put through during the presentation. I'm just going to wait a moment to see if anybody else has any final questions um, that they'd like to put forward. Um, whilst I'm waiting, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank uh, all of our uh, presenters this evening. Um, lots of really useful information uh, gathered. I'm sure there's lots of people uh, going to go away from here thinking, hmm, there's some opportunities there for me. Uh, okay, so we just had another question pop through. Um, are clean energy improvement payments typically offset by energy savings? If so, to what degree? So for this one, it really depends on the upgrade that you do, as well as the term that you choose for um, your payment. So our standard term would be the expected lifetime of the product. Um, which I believe for furnaces, it's between 15 and 20 years. Um, but you could choose potentially a lower term for that. Um, it also depends on a variety of different um, personal usage. So if you're home a lot of the time and you're using um, that product a lot, then potentially it won't, but it could um, be offset by energy saving. Um, there are similar programs where it's uh, called pay as you save and those ones the payment is directly tied to your energy savings. In this program we don't um, make that a stipulation so it, the long and short of it is uh, it does depend but um, some, some products it will be offset by energy savings. Okay, um, and just for fun, <laughs> I'm gonna put the poll up one more time. Now we have a little bit more uh, information, same question. Um, and please feel free to vote uh, again. Um, and it's just really for fun, so it's sort of more interactive for everyone who's uh, participating. Um, I think we may have um, 
answered all the questions. Oh, no, one more um, question for Valerie. Uh, if someone is taking a loan on from ATB uh, for a solar installation, uh, is the payment of the solar likely to outweigh the interest accrued? Um, In your experience. <laughs> <laughs> Say, say the last part again. Is it written somewhere? I just want to read. Uh, no, this is a question for me, actually. Oh, okay. Can you say it again, Jody? <laughs> sure. The... So if someone was to take out a loan uh, yep. for a solar panel, um, would they be likely earning more from their solar panels than they would be paying in interest? Oh, you know what? It's going to be specific to the design of the system and what that looks like because they're – it's really a case by case scenario, right? Um, when you look at a system size, uh, let's say you have a you know three kilowatt system and then you have an eight kilowatt system. The eight kilowatt system, while you're paying more upfront, you're actually paying less as far as price per watt goes and that system is going to pay itself off faster. You're going to have a higher uh, rate of return on it. Um, so, it, I think it's really going to vary um, individually, and I think it could go either way, where, okay. you know, the, the benefit of um, the, I guess, solar could outweigh, you know, like the interest and things like that, you'll, you'll end up ahead. Um, I guess the thing to keep in mind, though, is that <clears throat> there's so much more like there's so many more other values involved, carbon footprint, um, things of that nature, and people aren't just looking at it from a bottom line perspective. Um, it's more about a legacy and what they want to do to contribute um, to their community and to the earth. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Valerie. Yeah. Um, and we've had no more questions pop in, so I think everyone is fairly satisfied. Um, once again, I'd like to say thank you to everyone for participating um, this evening. Uh, thank you to our panelists for uh, presenting this evening. Um, and if anybody wants to uh, review any of the information presented tonight, uh, we will be uh, sharing a recording of this um, as, long, as well as the slides and additional um, resources on our website and I think that's everything uh, so thank you everyone for joining us and we will hopefully see you all soon